the word integrity comes from the word integrate. And the idea is that integrity is when all parts of our lives are integrated into harmony, that we are consistent in the various areas of our life. Somebody has said that the measure of somebody's character is what they will do when they believe no one will ever find out what they had done. That's, you know, integrity is who you are when no one's looking. John Maxwell, let me read a quote from him. He writes, A person with integrity does not have divided loyalties. That's duplicity. Nor is he or she merely pretending. That's hypocrisy. People with integrity are whole people. They can be identified by their single-mindedness. People of integrity have nothing to hide and nothing to fear. Their lives are open books. Integrity is not what we do so much as who we are. When there is an erosion of integrity, there becomes a, a, a gradual compromise in who we are. It, what that happens in society, and we see it in businesses, but we also see it in our own lives. Think about, let's say, the way we drive. Um, it starts by saying, what is the Christian thing to do? What does God tell us to do? And then we start saying, well, what is legally required for us to do? And then we take it another step and say, what can we get away with? And that's an erosion of integrity. So our goal this morning is to look at Joseph because this story, this, this weird story of uh, Joseph and Potiphar's wife is a story of consistency and integrity. And we can learn something about why Joseph was the way he was. Now, we're cynical about integrity because we live in a society that's got all kinds of examples of a lack of integrity. Think about the stories of lawmakers who go on lavish vacations and bill it to the country. Pastors with a hidden side. We've been seeing that in the news, unfortunately. These uh, well-known pastors, and we find out that there's a whole other world that's going on out there. People who call you and give you a wonderful opportunity to invest in something, and you say, this is fantastic. I could use a greater return on my investment. Then you find out that you've just been scammed out of all your money. There's those people who will call you or send you a message on your computer and say, you are... You've, got, you've been infected, and if you call us, we will fix your computer. Yeah, they'll fix you, all right. And it's really just a scam. It's a way of getting your money. And so this lack of integrity in our society is something that we just become cynical about. We just assume that everybody is a crook. What happens here is that we see Joseph becoming this, this incredible guy that he gets... We know the story. He was sold into a slavery. He ends up in Potiphar's house. Um, and it says that, that Potiphar was a high-ranking um, Egyptian official. He was captain of the guard for Pharaoh. Now, the question is, what does that mean? It could be, there's lots of different uh, explanations. One is that he was the head of the security force for Pharaoh. In other words, like he would be the head of uh, the Secret Service in the White House. Some people say that he was over all the prisons. That's unlikely because later we hear about Joseph and the warden. So <clears throat> I don't think he was the, the prison warden. It's possible that he could have been the guy that was in charge of all the stuff that happened in the palace, making him similar to what, what they would call the chief butler at the White House. He was in charge. He ran everything. We don't know. We know that he was a high-ranking official. So let's Jump in here. Verse 2, the Lord was with Joseph, so he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar, that's his name, noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of his entire household and everything he owned. From the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly, and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing except what kind of food to eat. 
Now, what happens here is Joseph is seen as a guy who's giving his best, even in the worst situation. Put yourself in Joseph's shoes and imagine how you would react to this. Your brothers not only don't like you, they wanted you dead. And they were willing to sell you as a slave. That's not a good place to be. And then you end up as a slave in the house of an Egyptian official. I don't know about you, but I think I'd be a little crabby at that point. Not too happy, wondering, God, you gave me all these visions of things that were going to happen, and look at where I am. I'm in Egypt. I am just here as a household slave. Yes, my owner likes me, but so what? I'm still here in servitude. But that's not Joseph's attitude. Joseph seems to give the best that he has in whatever situation he's in. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31 tells us that whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Now, he didn't have the New Testament, but he had the mindset of God here. He understood that no matter where he was, God was working in his life, and God was going to use that for his purpose. Now, later on, In this same passage, we see what happens later. And this is in verse, uh, let's see, well, 19 and following. Potiphar was furious. He took Joseph, threw him into the prison where the king's prisoners were held, and there he remained. But the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. That's interesting, isn't it? And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. So whether he's in the palace or whether he's in the prison, it doesn't make any difference. Before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. So integrity is something that does not change with our circumstance. Romans 13 tells us that we are to be subject to all the governing authorities. And, and, and Joseph gets that. He was the same no matter what. I'm troubled because sometimes you hear people say, when they're talking about certain ethical issues or something, they'll say, well, you know, that's Christianity. This is business. Have you ever heard somebody say that? Maybe you've said that. That's my religious life. This is my personal life. Integrity is realizing that it's all God's. Every moment is supposed to be lived for him. Joseph gets that. So whether he is in, to use a phrase of the kind of Paul, he didn't say it this way, but basically Paul was saying, I've learned to be content whether I'm in the outhouse or the penthouse. Either way, I'm going to serve the Lord. That's integrity. Second, integrity does not compromise values. Joseph was loyal to the Lord no matter what. Listen to the circumstance in verse 8. The end of uh, where we were reading earlier, we found out that Joseph is this good-looking guy. Joseph was handsome, well-built young man. Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded. But Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you, because you're his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. And then she kept putting pressure on him. Day after day, but he refused to sleep with her, and he kept out of her way. (laughs) Kept out of her way. I'm going to avoid her as much as possible. One day, however, no one else was around. And this is probably something that Mrs. Potiphar set up when he went in to do his work. She came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, Come on, sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. Mrs. Potiphar set him up. But Joseph hung in there. As I said, integrity is acting on core principles even when you're pretty sure you can get away with something. Basically, what Mrs. Potiphar was saying was, nobody will ever know. Nobody's here. Just come and be with me, and everything will be fine. Ah, 
Joseph was smarter than that. And I love the fact that we're told that he, he ran away. Sometimes you ought not to debate with the devil or the devil's uh, agent because as soon as you start doing that, you've stepped into his quicksand. And it's going to be very tough to get out. He had some core principles, and it seems like some of his core principles were this. Do what God says is right. Principle number one. Two, be loyal to those in authority over you. Three, it is better to be faithful and get in trouble than to be unfaithful. Those are the principles that he seems to be working with. Listen to these words from uh, Proverbs chapter 6. Good words. The man who commits adultery is an utter fool, for he destroys himself. Isn't that interesting? You start becoming destroyed on the inside. He will be wounded and disgraced. His shame will never be erased. It's hard to recover from that. For the woman's jealous husband will be furious, and he will show no mercy when he takes revenge. He will accept no compensation, nor be satisfied with a payoff of any size. So, Joseph is smart enough to know that he needed to run. He ran, leaving his cloak behind, which leads us to the third principle about integrity. So integrity does not change with circumstances. It does not compromise values. And third, it is, always, it is not always appreciated or rewarded. Yeah, we could say that. He does the right thing, but now he gets in trouble. Verses 13 through 20. When she saw that she was holding his cloak and he had fled, she called out to her servants. Soon all the men came running. Nothing like a woman scorned here. Look, she said, my husband has brought this Hebrew slave, so she's being derogatory, here to make fools of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream, he ran outside and got away, but he left his cloak behind me. Interesting, the story has changed, hasn't it? She kept the cloak with her until her husband came home. Then she told him her story. That Hebrew slave you have brought into our house, <laughs> now she's blaming Potiphar, tried to come in and fool around with me, she said. But when I screamed, he ran outside, leaving his cloak with me. He did the right thing. And still he ends up getting in trouble. There is no um, guarantee that things are going to go well for people who um, do what's right. I mean, think about, remember back in school, um, if you were like me, you were one of those uh, students that really depended on the curve in the class. You know? <laughs> I may have passed depending on the curve. You know? How low will passing go is what I wanted to know. And there was always that one smart kid that would ruin the curve, right? Did that person do anything wrong? Absolutely not. And yet sometimes they're vilified because they were doing their best. And, and that's the way it is in our society. We, we take shots at people who do their best. Here's some ideas. A hospital employee who refuses to do an immoral or, or ethically questionable act might very well be fired. An employee who refuses to fudge the numbers on a contract could be let go. Someone who tells the truth about a crime that they witnessed could be treated harshly by those who were involved in wrongdoing. And someone who exposes an inappropriate act somewhere may be hated by those who don't want to believe it's true. Which is one of the problems with what's called whistleblowers when they, they call attention to something that's wrong. People pile on them because they don't want to have evil exposed. Because when somebody is living in the light, it exposes all the things that are in the darkness. Now there's an interesting dilemma here. If, if my information is correct in what I read, that a attempted rape is a capital offense. So you could be killed for it. So much more so when it is a slave attempting to rape a official's wife. Why did Potiphar simply throw him to jail? Isn't that an interesting question? Why didn't he have him executed? 
Is it possible that Potiphar knew his wife? Is it possible that he's been here before? Is it possible that he had to get rid of Joseph because he had to support his wife even though he was pretty sure what really happened? And maybe that makes it worse, doesn't it, for Joseph? That he does the right thing. His boss perhaps knew he was doing the right thing and still he's in prison. So integrity is not always appreciated. And fourth, I want you to see that integrity really is a blessing from God. Over and over in this text, we read that, that the Lord blessed Joseph. Now, if you're Joseph, do you feel blessed? I'm in servanthood. Now I'm in prison. Do I feel blessed? Maybe he did, but I wouldn't. Would you? We would say, God, where are you? What are you doing? Somewhere along the line, Joseph understood that God was doing something that he didn't even understand. And we're going to see this a lot more next week when we talk about being in God's waiting room, waiting for God to do something. Joseph is faithful even in this tough situation. He understood that blessing from God is not the same thing as everything going well. Sometimes God is working even through, always God is working through adverse circumstances. We don't always see it. Joseph's faith in God was so strong that he was able to say, Lord, I'm going to keep doing what's right, believing that somewhere along the line, you're doing something in this circumstance. I don't see it yet. This doesn't seem to be working very well. Occasionally when I pray, I say, Lord, if you'd like a suggestion, here's what I'd like to see happen. Never once has he said, oh, thank you. <clears throat> because God sees much more clearly than I do. And Joseph seemed to understand that. Joseph knew he was in God's hands, and therefore he was blessed. God was using Joseph in his slavery, in his imprisonment, and later we're going to see Joseph rise to the ranks in Egypt itself and save his own people. There was a supernatural battle that we are fighting. It is not something we can be uh, passive about. This isn't about what is easiest in life. It's about doing what is best. Integrity is saying, I'm going to do what God wants me to do regardless of what the world says, regardless of what the consequences may be. He told his dad that his brothers weren't being very faithful out on the job. Not a popular thing to do, but it probably was the right thing to do. He resists Mrs. Potiphar, even though it probably wasn't the most uh, popular thing for him to do. And even in prison, there's some things that we'll see next week that he could have taken another course, but he didn't. He kept following the way of God, trusting that in the midst of this trial, God was still at work. It's a story about um, the Great Wall of China. Um, they actually built the Great Wall to protect themselves from what they thought would be the northern invaders. And so they decided to build a wall that was really, really tall so that nobody could scale it and really, really thick so that nobody could ever knock it down or tunnel under it. And the idea was that if we build a wall like that, it will be impenetrable and we will be protected. In the first hundred years that that wall was there, China was invaded three times by invading armies. They didn't knock down the wall. They didn't go over the wall. You know what they did? They bribed the gatekeepers. So China put all this effort into protecting itself with this wall and forgot to deal with the integrity of the people who are going to manage the wall. Is that happening for us? Is that happening in our society? We, um, we put our trust in a powerful military. We 
protest about freedom. We, we go out there and we speak our minds. We increasingly believe in the power of government to solve our problems. And yet, we know that without integrity, all of these things can become corrupt and totally useless to protect us. Even in Christianity, listen to some of these ideas. We summon people to follow Christ and holiness. And yet in the church, divorce, abuse, immorality, addiction are just as prevalent as they are in the rest of the world. We talk about how we are all one body. We all, all us Christians, we get along together. And yet in our zest to build the biggest church, we ridicule and criticize other churches so that we can get more people in our church. We proclaim love, yet we vilify those with whom we disagree and burn with a desire of revenge for those who hurt us. We call the Bible the Word of God, yet we feel quite free to ignore its commands when they become inconvenient to our lifestyle. We have a problem with integrity. God calls us to be people who are truth-tellers because He is a God of truth. We are to live our lives consistent with the truth that we proclaim. He wants us not only to preach and proclaim love, huh, He actually wants us to love because that's what He does. He wants us to be followers of Jesus, whether it's popular or whether it's not. Whether it brings us an advantage or a disadvantage. He wants us to see and treat other people the way He does, whether or not they do the same. It, should, it shouldn't be this way, but it is. A person of integrity is going to stand out in the world. Isn't that sad? A person who lives a life of integrity stands out because they are so rare. With some people, living a life of integrity will make you a target. But for others, for many others, it's going to make you the person that others want to turn to, <clears throat> that others trust, that others believe and follow. And because of this, I think God wants us to pursue integrity with every ounce of strength that we have because it matters. So let's pray. Father, in this world of compromise, in this world where we do that which works, which will get us what we want, we know that we need to be people of integrity. But quite frankly, it's becoming harder and harder to know what that is. So Lord, help us to devour your word, to watch your son, to pay attention to those who have done it right through the years. Then help us to learn from their examples so that we might be used mightily by you. Lord, so grant that we might live our lives that others might see you in us, that they might be drawn to you because of us. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.